Well, amen. It's a joy to be back with you again this week. It's amen. good to see you all. Hope you've had a good week in the Lord thus far. And uh, thank you for the opportunity again to open the scriptures with you tonight. We'll go to 1 John this evening. 1 John chapter number 1. Coming to the epistles of the Apostle John now as we continue on looking at some matters here in these uh, final sections of God's Word that belong to the ages to come as far as the doctrine's concerned. And I uh, got 1st, 2nd, 3rd John here in the sequence of things. And so the Apostle John, of course, is the one who is being used of God to pin down these next few epistles that we're looking at. And, uh, of course, when we talk about John, we understand that uh, John was actually used by the Holy Spirit to pin down uh, five books of Scripture. And uh, those, of course, being uh, the Gospel of John. He, one of the Gospels bears the name of John. He's the penman there. Um, the first, second, and third epistles of John. And then he also was used to pin down the Revelation. And so five books of Scripture that the Holy Spirit uses the Apostle John to write for us. And uh, we've got them here preserved in our King James Bible that we can study and appreciate and understand some things that God has to the Apostle John minister. And uh, when we talk about the Apostle John, of course, John, uh, like Peter, was one of the 12 apostles that had followed the Lord in his earthly ministry. Uh, he had been there uh, really from the beginning. Um, you know, he was, he was one that had believed the preaching of John the Baptist early on there when he came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and um, had submitted to John's baptism and were looking for the Messiah. And then uh, as it was recorded there in, I believe it's John chapter 1, uh, there was a, a day following Christ when he was manifest to Israel through his baptism that John, looking upon him, said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And John and, um, and uh, his brother uh, James, I believe it was, followed the Lord and began to follow Jesus from that point. And we're given to see that in the Gospel of John. And, and uh, of course, John was named an apostle along with the other 11 in Matthew chapter 10, commissioned and sent out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel there in Matthew chapter 10 and was given the authority to preach the gospel of the kingdom yes, and given the power to perform the signs of the kingdom, to heal all manner of sickness and disease and to... Um, cast out devils and the like, manifesting the signs of the kingdom of Israel. John was there for all that. He had been involved with all that. And John, of course, is one of those 12 that ultimately is going to be sitting on one of those 12 thrones when Messiah establishes his kingdom. That's promised to them. And John has a part in that. And um, John, of course, along with his brother James, were sons of Zebedee, fishermen of Galilee, like Peter and his brother Andrew. And um, as I said, had believed early on with the preaching of John the Baptist in the wilderness there, began to follow Jesus, had a ministry to Israel. And John was one that saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ uh, there after he raised from the dead. And uh, John had part in that ministry. He was there on Jer in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost uh, with the little flock, baptized with the Holy Ghost at that time, and was an apostle that was to and for the nation Israel. And had a ministry that was akin to that of, of Peter and James and the others and um, had uh, been partaker of that kingdom ministry to Israel. And, you know, that, that realization of his apostleship and what, what he had an apostleship in connection with, uh, I think, is, is paramount to understanding and to, to properly uh, orienting ourselves to the doctrine that he teaches and that he's used of the Holy Spirit to write down, recognizing that John was an apostle to and for the nation Israel. One of those 12, and a minister of the things that belong to them. And I say that because especially the Gospel of John is a, a work that many believers today consider to be the, really the, the foundation of, of the, the, the main place you should go, as it were, to find the doctrine of salvation in Christ. And uh, that, that, of course, is um, John seems to be the, the favorite gospel of a lot of folks. And I think the reason for that is because John speaks so much about the issue of faith and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and that type of thing. Things that uh, when you, you take them on the, the, the surface and you don't put them in their proper historical context and in their proper dispensational context, understanding what's being ministered, 
And what John's recording there, it's easy to take some things that you learn from the Apostle Paul and start reading the back end of things that John talks about. Uh, you kind of have to cherry pick a little bit in order to do that. But nevertheless, that's what happens. And because there's so much said about faith and belief on the Lord, uh, sometimes Pauline doctrine gets read back in. And uh, many believers today look at John as a, a key place to go to find the truth about salvation. And... Um, Certainly that's, that's a common idea, but that is just not the case when you put things in their, their historical perspective and understand the ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ had from what's called the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the things concerning the kingdom. The events of John are still happening within that same historical period. It's the same Lord Jesus Christ of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you can't just take John out and uh, make it, you know, grace doctrine uh, because you see the words faith and belief and uh, taken in isolation sounds like some of the things that Paul says. Um, and you know, I'm not saying that there's not any spiritual application there and there's not some interdispensational principles that you can use from verses that are given in John. But what I'm saying is that in order to, to comprehend the, the, the gospel that John is setting forth and what he's, what he's ministering concerning Jesus Christ, You've got to place it within the proper dispensational context. And the Apostle John was a minister to Israel. He's a minister in the Lord's earthly ministry. And has the same type of ministry as Peter and James and others. And was doing the same things during the gospel period. And uh, he has that ministry to Israel. And John truly to, to appreciate what he deals with, not only in the gospel, but in the epistles and in Revelation. You've got to, to understand it within the, the prophetic context and the prophetic program of which it's given and, and how the things that he's talking about affects Israel in order to, to really appreciate it. And I think that only as you do that then do those interdispensational principles and spiritual applications come to life for the way that they, they need to be. It's got to be understood in the program first and the way that God's designed it to work first. And so I think that we'll see some of that as we get into this. And um, it's, it's an important thing to recognize that John is uh, ministering some things here in the inspired writing that belong to the prophetic program and the ages to come, especially when we get here to the epistles. And uh, we're going to look at some of the things that he talks about. Now, as we cover John's epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the way that we're going to approach this is going to be a little bit different than the way that we've looked at some of the other of the Hebrew epistles. And by that, what I mean is that we're not going to be so concerned with outlining every chapter and verse section. Rather, we're going to be looking more on a, a general theme basis of what John covers and the, the doctrinal objective of not only 1 John, but 2 John and 3 John and try to look at, at his epistles really as a grouping around the, the, the general doctrinal objective that, that uh, he's, he's looking to convey and that he's looking to communicate here in his epistles. And we're doing that because I believe that there's an interconnectedness to all of John's writings, uh, especially when you talk about the epistles and things that he ministers in, in his gospel, there's an interconnectedness with that where uh, things that he talks about here in 1st and 2nd and 3rd John are doctrinally founded back upon things that the Holy Spirit had him deal with in his gospel. And we're going to see some verses that would allude to that and point us in that direction, but there, there's really an interconnectedness where the Holy Spirit is, is communicating some special truths through John for the little flock that, that they need to comprehend and understand and, and, uh, and um, really have a foundation for. And that foundation for it is laid down in the first epistle, or in the, the first uh, writing, the gospel. Okay, and so uh, it, I say all that to say that the things that he deals with here in the epistles can't be adequately appreciated without having some understanding of the, the types of doctrinal things that John deals with in his gospels, or in his gospel rather. We're going to see a connection between that. And as you, you look back and forth, you're going to see that really what he's ministering in the epistles is just further developments of things that they've already heard from him in the gospel. And when you, we talk about that, there's, there's some unique things that the Holy Spirit has John to minister. And um, I think that the first thing we need to appreciate when it comes to the epistles here is that 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John are... Couch kind of within the, the middle of an of a important section of doctrine that's given in the Hebrew his, epistles here as a whole. And there, there are epistles, there are three of five that deal with this issue of the satanic policy of evil 
that's going to be directed against the little flock out here in the ages to come. We've seen that starting already back in 2 Peter. Now, we've been talking about that the last few weeks when we were looking at the doctrine that 2 Peter deals with and how that he, he focuses in upon how that, that roaring lion that he alluded to at the end of 1 Peter begins to walk about and to seek whom they may devour. And in 2 Peter, he talked about the false teachers and their damnable heresies and how that they'll come in and uh, do this privily and deny the Lord and all this type of thing. And they've got to be on guard. They've got to be aware of these false teachers that are coming in and the, the policy of evil that's looking to, to lead them away with the error of the wicked. And 2 Peter got that started. And, and 1 John here is no different. He's going to come in. He's going to pick up on that same idea that was left off with by Peter. And he's going to be developing some further things in relation to the, the policy of evil that's against the little flock. And he's going to do that in 1 John. He's going to do that in 2 John and in 3 John. And also Jude is going to pick up on that same idea of the satanic policy of evil against them. And so from 2 Peter and running all the way over to the, the epistle of Jude, you've got five books of scripture there that are devoted to this topic of the policy of evil against them. Now when you consider the fact that You've got five of these books that are written to them that's dealing with that subject and, and various facets and aspects of it. That, that tells you a little bit about how great the, the satanic deception is going to be out here when this time's in effect. When you think about that the, the Holy Spirit of God has to give five books of scripture, doctrine upon doctrine upon doctrine, to the little flock about, about that particular issue... It starts giving you some insight into how difficult it really is going to be over here for them to endure to the end. Right? They've got to be single-minded. Right? They can't be that double-minded man that James talks about. He's unstable in all his ways. They've got to be single-minded in this issue and, and have their hand to the plow and not looking back and these types of things because the satanic policy of evil and his deception is going to be working overtime, as it were, out here in this time. He's always done that. He's always tried to lead people astray. There's always been deception and false teachers and false prophets. As long as God's been speaking, the adversary's been speaking something contrary to that and trying to lead men astray. But as the program goes along, the deception and the, the false prophets and the false teaching becomes greater and greater and greater. And it takes some fortification and some edification, spiritual stamina to endure to the end as the little flock's been exhorted to. And the doctrine that's given here in the epistles, especially of 2 Peter, running over to Jude, are given to, to deal with the various uh, facets of, of, of the policy of evil so that the little flock doesn't have to be led astray by it. And they can be doctrinally founded and, and do exactly what the Lord wants them to do and endure to the end of it and be counted worthy to stand before the Son of Man when he returns to establish the kingdom. And so... I think the way that I'm going to show you this is similar to the way that we made the transition between these others of the Hebrew epistles. Um, at, the, at the ending of each epistle, there's some verses given that allude to the next phase of doctrine that they need to be edified in. We've seen it from Hebrews to James and James to 1 Peter, the same from 1 Peter to 2 Peter. And the same thing I think is going to hold true here is we can see the, the doctrinal link or the connection between where Peter left off and what John's going to be picking up with. So I want to show you those verses here to get ourselves underway with this. And uh, the first verses I'll actually read here in your hearing is, uh, if you look back across the page to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, as he closes out, and we looked at these verses last week. After he said all these things about the false teachers and giving them these warnings, he uh, closes with a, another warning to them. And he says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware... Lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And so Peter here warns them that in addition to these damnable heresies that the false teachers have brought in and the denial of the Lord Jesus Christ and what they'll be guilty of, he tells the little flock that they need to beware lest they also be led away with the error of the wicked. Right, there's some wicked ones that they must be aware of, that if they are not on guard, it's going to be very easy for them to be led astray. That there's, there's an appeal to the error, as it were. A seductiveness to it, that if they're not 
vigilant. And they're not sober, right? That's what he told them at the, at the end of 1 Peter. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You've got to be diligent in these matters. And you've got to be vigilant to attend to this doctrine. Not to be taken out of the way. To keep your steadfastness. Because if you're not, and you're not abiding in the truth... You're not entertaining the truth in your mind and thinking on these things and, and counting the Lord faithful that promised and holding fast to your profession and all these things that they've been exhorted to. If they're not giving diligence to those things, adding these, these virtues to their faith as he exhorted them in 2 Peter, if they're not doing that, the, the appeal and the seductiveness and the deception that's out there in the, the error of the wicked is not only going to cause these that are a part of it, to bring upon themselves swift destruction, but there's the potential, if they don't beware, for they themselves to be led astray with it. And he says, you got to watch. Watch and pray. And be sober and be steadfast in these truths, lest you be led away with it. There's a seductiveness to the way of the wicked. And it's seductive because it's not going to be easily recognized if they're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. Right, these false teachers, they, they bring in, they do it privily. Right? Privily they bring in these damnable heresies. There's, there's wolves that are in sheep's clothing. From the outward appearance, you look at them, it looks like, you know, this, this is one that's of us. They say they belong to him and they're one of his sheep, but yet inwardly they're ravening wolves and whited sepulchers. And they're false teachers and false prophets. You've got to beware. There's a seductiveness to what... These false teachers are bringing. And Peter warns them about that. And the Apostle John picks up on that very issue. And he's going to talk about the seductiveness of these that are bringing in contrary doctrines. If you look in 1 John chapter 2, in verse number 26. Right, he's been saying some things here for a chapter and a half, almost two. And then he says some things about what he has said to this point. 1 John 2, verse 26, he says, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Right, see, there's a seductiveness to it. There's some things that John has been communicating to this point in the epistle. And he says, These things that I've talked about, these things that I've written, are concerning them that seduce you. There's a seductiveness to what they bring. There's an appeal and an allure to it that's, that's looking to lead them astray into the error of the wicked. John's dealing with that. One of the key and repetitive phrases that you'll find and come to appreciate in John's epistles especially is this phrase or something similar to, by this ye know. You'll see him say that type of thing or something akin to it over and over. By this ye know, by this ye know, by this ye know. What John's doing is he's giving them a series of tests. A series of, of, of things that they can look at, that they can put these men and, and these spirits to the test to try them according to what John is giving them to know up from down, right from wrong, true from false. And as you apply these tests that John's given them, he's given them the doctrinal foundation to, to abide in the truth and to do what he says there and look at these men that though they're saying some things that may sound right on the surface, he says when you put them to the test... And you apply these things that I'm giving to you, by this you're going to know. When you see this, it means that. When you see that, it means this. And if they'll abide in that doctrine, they'll get the critical discernment that they need to be able to make that discernment. Am I dealing with a sheep or am I dealing with a wolf? Am I dealing with a true believer, a true member of the little flock, or am I dealing with one of those ravening wolves that the Lord was talking about? Am I dealing with the spirit of Christ or am I dealing with the spirit of Antichrist? Critical discernment in these matters. And you, you see him talking about these things. By this you know, by this you know, by this you know. Ultimately, the doctrinal function of what John covers in his epistles is to give the little flock the ability to make a discernment between a child of God and a child of the devil. There's some things that are going to be your sure fire sign that you're dealing with a child of God. And then there's some other things when you see it, you should know you're dealing with a child of the devil. And when you're able to make that discernment and you can clearly see this is a child of God, this is a child of the devil, it, it, it preserves you and it keeps you from being led away by the error of the wicked, doesn't it? Because I know the difference. 
Now, if you're not giving diligence to those things, you're not being sober, you're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, you're trying to judge things after human wisdom, lean to your own understanding, as it were, then it's, there's a seductiveness to it. You're going to be led away and led astray thinking that you're going in the right way, and it's a way that ends in destruction. The Lord did say that there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Amen. Can't rely upon your own wisdom. It's the proverb says, lean not to thine own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. He shall direct thy paths. He does that through the word. As with us, so with them, through the word and through the, the doctrine that they've been given. To be able to make the discernment between a child of God and a child of the devil. And you'll see John talk about those things as we get into the meat of the verses. Now another introductory point to the epistles here that I wanted to, to make to you is that, as I said earlier, many things that are dealt with in John's epistles are based upon truths that were first set down in the Gospel of John. That's important to realize because there's some passages in 1 John especially that oftentimes with folks that don't rightly divide the word of truth and even with those that do, that don't have a, a real good grip on things that were talked about in the Gospel of John, there, there's some wild interpretations that come out of passages in 1 John. I mean, there, there's verses here where he'll, he'll say things like, uh, you know, uh, 1 John 3, 9 there, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Right? You've got some people out here today that are they're preaching the concept of sinless perfection. Right? There's, there's several verses here that's just, you know, it's taking it, people run with it, and you get all kinds of off-the-wall interpretations out of passages in 1 John. And I think that the, the main and primary reason for that, not only... First of all, not somebody not rightly dividing the word of truth, it all stems back to a, a lack of understanding, or at least a sufficient understanding, of things that began to be talked about in the Gospel of John. Right? John is not just saying these things that he's saying out of the blue. This is not the basic foundational doctrines of things. These are things where he's, he's building out the, the superstructure, as it were, on things that his audience has already heard from him before. He's already talked about some things so that when he, he talks about these types of issues and he brings them out, you know, that, that's not in isolation from everything else. This is not something that they're to take and to, to build a brand new doctrine upon as though this is, you know, some brand new revelation. These are things that they have heard from the beginning. And he'll say that and these type of things, that, you know, and he makes a pretty obvious statement as he starts the epistle there in the first three verses where he clearly links what he's talking about in these epistles right back to things that he had already dealt with in the gospel. He gives pretty much a recap of what the gospel of John was all about in uh, the first three verses of uh, 1 John. Here, 1 John 1, verse 1, look at these verses here. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it. And bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Those first three verses there are essentially... A recap of what John dealt with in his gospel. Right? It begins almost in the same way that the gospel of John began. Remember John 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And he continues on talking about that Word. And gets down to John 1.14. And he says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Right? The, the eternal Word, God the Son, the Word, was made flesh, came into the world through a virgin's womb, took on flesh as Israel's Messiah. And John says he dwelt among us. Well, that's essentially what he's talking about here in 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning. Right? That eternal Word that was with the Father, who made all things, became flesh. And they said, he says, we've handled him, we've looked upon him, our eyes have seen him. Our ears have heard him. 
That eternal word made flesh. Him which is from the Father. Eternal life we've handled. In the person of Jesus Christ. That's what the Gospel of John was all about declaring. It was emphasizing the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Causing Israel to behold their God. And he's, he's manifesting the Father to them. Right? No man's seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. That's what the Gospel of John was given over to showing about the Lord Jesus Christ. And He says, These things which we've seen and heard of the eternal Word made flesh, which we have handled and looked upon and heard, He says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. Right? And the obvious place where He's declared this unto them is in the Gospel of John. This is what they've heard from Him. And they have fellowship. With the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, on that basis. From the very beginning of the epistle, He's linking things back to what they've already heard in the Gospel. It's founded upon that. Not only that, look at chapter 2 here. 1 John 2, verse 7. He says, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment. Which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Right? I'm talking about things you've already heard before. This is doctrine that's already been taught. These are things that have begun to be laid down in the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I'm talking about. Verse 24. He said, let that therefore abide in you. Which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. From the beginning. Chapter 3, verse 11. He says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. It's not new doctrine, it's what you've heard from the beginning. And then if you come over to 2 John, verses 5 and 6, makes a similar statement. 2 John 5 and 6. He says, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning... You should walk in it. All right, so he's still talking about things that are that they got started from the beginning. Th things that were talked about in the beginning. That time-wise things have progressed in the prophetic outworking of God's plan and purpose. Where the doctrine is applying for where they stand at this point. Things have developed further. And he's enhancing and building upon that doctrine. But he says this is still that which was spoken from the beginning. Right, we're just coming to the realization of things that the Lord taught about in his earthly ministry. Things that he said about this time over here and the, the false teachers and the spirit of Antichrist that would come. And how that there would be deception and, and the, the, there would be those that seduce you. And there would be the wolves in sheep's clothing. And you'd have to make critical discernment between the children of God and the children of the devil. And you have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves and be able to judge these things. He says, I'm talking to you about things that the Lord was talking about. And the Holy Spirit is just enhancing that, right? The Lord said at the end of his ministry that he had many things yet to speak unto them, but they couldn't bear them now. But when the Comforter was come and the Holy Spirit came, that he would guide them and lead them into all truth. And he's doing that through their apostles and the inspired scripture. Here. Now he says, we're building upon those things that were from the beginning that have been set down by the Lord. And that's what I'm declaring unto you. Giving you the doctrine of Christ in connection with that program. And so it's pretty clear from statements like this where he says it all throughout his epistles that he's speaking of things from the beginning and talking of things that they had heard from the beginning. John, uh, John is dealing with an audience that has heard some things from him already. They've already got a foundation in some of these things that he's talking about from the Gospel of John. It's going to be an important connection that we'll see as we get into some of these verses, looking at, at what the Gospel of John has to say about it, what's recorded that the Lord said, as recorded by John, in relation to things that now John's building upon in the epistles. They're inseparable. 
And it's important to appreciate that. Now, one of the major things here is I've alluded to, if we were to, to distill John's epistles down to just a basic statement, the thing that he's going to be focusing upon is an exposure policy in Israel by which this division is made between the, the children of God and the children of, de of the devil. Again, as we've just said, there's some things at the beginning that were talked about by this. This is not a new concept when we talk about a division coming in Israel. Now, we've talked about it at, at various times throughout this series when we've been looking at different doctrines, but actually John the Baptist, when he came preaching in the wilderness, began speaking of this division that would be made in the nation Israel. If you go back with me to Matthew chapter 3, I'll show you the verses. We've looked at these a number of times through the months for various reasons, but just as a reminder here, I'll show you that in the beginning of the gospel here, John, as he's preaching, baptizing with water, he speaks of this division that is to take place here in these last times. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John the Baptist here speaking says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Right? The threefold prescription for cleansing of the nation Israel. They've got a water washing. And they've, that's the water baptism there. They've got a baptism with the Holy Ghost and a baptism with fire. That's to be administered to the nation. And John is baptizing with the water. He's sent to preach and to baptize them with water under repentance. The Messiah is coming after him, and the Messiah is going to be the one that administers the second two, or the, the second and the third uh, baptism there for the nation. And he says in verse 12 there, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. All right, the separation in the nation between the wheat and the chaff. The Messiah is going to affect that. John, of course, in his ministry, has talked of him and said that, that John comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah, you remember back there on Mount Carmel, had asked the children of Israel the question, how long hawked you between two opinions? They were waffling over this issue of who God is. Is it Jehovah, the Lord, or is it Baal? And Elijah sent to ask him, how long are you going to hawk between these two opinions? If Jehovah's God, serve him. If Baal, serve him. But you've got to choose. Can't ride the fence. Can't hot between those two opinions. Make a choice. And in that same spirit and power, John the Baptist is sent preaching in the wilderness there to call the nation of Israel back into the covenant to repent and come back to the Lord. But it makes a division. And he's, he's facing the nation with the question, how long are you going to hot between two opinions? He talked earlier here in chapter 3 and verse 10 there how that the axe is laid to the root of the tree. In a very short time from where he's preaching, that axe is going to be picked up and the, the axe head's going to, be, going to be going through that tree. And as the axe head passes through the tree, it begins to, to affect this division. And at first it starts with just a, a small split, but as that axe head goes through the tree and it gets further and further, and the axe head gets wider as you go to the back as it's passing through there. The divide gets wider and wider until ultimately, when that works had its fullness, there's a complete separation. Right? A complete severing between two camps in Israel. You've got the true, and you've got the apostate. You've got the wheat, you've got the chaff. Him that serves God him that serves them not. The generation that's counted to the Lord or the generation of the viper. The vision. John's announcing it. The Lord ministers it. Throughout the gospel, he speaks of it. How it is going to grow and grow and grow and ultimately culminate in a complete separation. There's going to come a time that it, where it's manifest out here at this time which camp you're on. You're not going to be able to halt between the two opinions anymore. It's going to be clear cut one way or the other you're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. 
And only the children of God will be those that go into the kingdom as the true Israel, function as the nation that God's called them to be, whereas the chaff that's that apostate nation will be burnt up with unquenchable fire, purged out. Complete separation. Division. The Lord got it started in his ministry and it grows and grows to its fullness out in the time of the tribulation. That's doctrine that's set down from the beginning. Now when that complete severing happens as time's going along here and they get further and further along, it's going to ultimately be manifest which father these children of Israel have fellowship with. Right? That, that's part of the, the, the outworking of that, that division. That, that word that passes between the nation as an axe head, when it's beginning to separate, it's, it's identifying the, the children on either side of the line. And those children, as, as there's two camps of children within Israel, there's two fathers in Israel. And the, the manifestation that takes place through that time is which father do you have fellowship with? Now, John talks about this. One of the first things that he deals with in 1 John is the fellowship of the little flock. And what they have. If you go back over here to 1 John chapter 1. You'll see here after he reminds them of what he had talked about in the gospel. And that which was from the beginning here. In verse 3. He says this. 1 John 1 verse 3. He says that which we have seen and heard. Declare we unto you. That ye also may have fellowship with us. Who's our fellowship with, John? He says, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, he says that their fellowship is with the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who their fellowship is with. He says, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you. That God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. You see the contrast there? When he's talking about this issue of fellowship, he says our fellowship's with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And that fellowship that we have involves a, a walk that's in the light. God the Father is light. In Him is no darkness at all. And there's some that say that they have fellowship with Him. That they know Him. That they're one of His sheep. But yet, when you look at them, he says they, they walk in darkness. And he says when you see someone saying that they have fellowship with him and yet they're walking in darkness, there's something that you know about that. Amen. There's something that's manifest by the walk in darkness. And he says that when we, when we do that, he says we lie and do not the truth. The father that they're claiming to have fellowship with is not the father they actually have fellowship with. Now they may have a fellowship and they may have a father. But it's not our father. It's not the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're of their father the devil. And the lusts of their father they will do. He's a thief and a murderer from the beginning. And their lusts he will fulfill. And he says, so you can't necessarily go by just what they're saying. He says, you've got to put them to the test. Because there's an issue here of light and darkness. Fellowship. With a certain father that manifests what kind of child you're dealing with. The test whereby they know. It's making manifest. Again, they say they're sheep, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. And it gets exposed to a walk in darkness. And some other things that John goes on to mention here. If you look at chapter 2, I'll read verse 18 and 19. He says, they're little children... It is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, 
Even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Watch this now, verse 19. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Right, there were some that were among them. He says that they went out from us. They were impersonating a sheep. But they were not all of us. And he says that that happened, that it might be made manifest. Something's being made manifest by what they've done. Something's, something can be known when they put them to the test. And they see these types of things. He said in verse 20 there, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Got that critical discernment to be able to identify those that were not of them. Chapter 3, verse number 10. He says there, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. That's a pretty plain statement, isn't it? Now, there's a way that you can know a child of God from the child of the devil. There's, there's something that manifests it. When they don't do righteousness, they're not of God. And when they don't love the brethren, they're not of God. You're able to identify a child of God from a child of the devil by the test that John has given. And these things are manifest. There's an exposure policy that's making a difference between the, ch the children of God and the children of the devil. Making, making the distinction clear cut. Putting them on one side of the fence or the other as being revealed and, and manifest as things are going along. And there's a lot of things that go into that. I know we haven't talked about what all that means as far as putting them to the test, but it's fairly apparent just on the surface level reading of the, the type of words that John's using to describe what he's talking about that he's, he's interested in an exposure policy, a manifestation of some things between the lie and the truth. Right, the fellowship that they have. What type of children are they? Them that seduce you. Being able to discern and understand and recognize them for who they are. Exposure and manifestation of true identity. The epistle is given to the little flock to give them the ability to try those that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. We'll say in another place. Be able to try them. Come to a conclusion about it. And know that you've got the right judgment. Find them to be liars. And keep themselves from being led away with the error of the wicked. As the Apostle Peter warned. And so you can see that this, this concept is present here in the epistles of John. And again, the, the, the repeated phrase that we'll see is, By this ye know. By this ye know. By this ye know. From this we know this. From that we know that. Giving them the ability to discern and make the, the critical distinction with these that seduce them and, and what they're dealing with. Making the division manifest. Being able to recognize it as the emphasis and the doctrine of John's epistles. Now, I know I'm dealing with this pretty generally tonight. We'll get into some of the meat of the epistle next time, but... Another thing that I wanted to point out and remind you of, and I think that this is, this is very critical, especially for us, is that we need to remember who John's writing to and recognize that the tests that John is giving in 1 John are designed to work in the ages to come. Right? They're designed tests for a very specific time when a specific situation exists in the world. These are not tests that are designed for you and I in the dispensation of grace to take from John's letters that begin applying to people and making judgments about the children of God and the children of the devil based on these tests John gives. They're not designed to work in the dispensation of grace. These are tests specific to a time when a certain situation exists. They only work when the world is in that situation. And in fact, I would suggest to you that if you try to go by the test that John gives, 
and you apply that in the dispensation of grace where it don't belong, not only are you going to make errant judgments, but you yourself are going to end up deceived. Because these tests don't work in the dispensation of grace. You take, for instance, chapter 4, verse 1. He says there, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now he's just said that this is a test by which you're going to know the Spirit of God. When you try the spirits, apply this test. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now you take that test and you try to apply that in the dispensation of grace. And you're going to find that there are there's some folks out here in a pseudo false Christianity that will pass that test. They will confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And yet, in their doctrine, they teach all types of, of heresy. They preach works for salvation. They don't declare the gospel of the grace of God. Justification by grace, through faith, without works of any kind. They preach works for salvation. And they preach another Jesus and another gospel, but yet they'll confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Well, if you take the verse strictly for what it says, if you're going to know the Spirit of God by that, you're looking at these that are teaching errant doctrine, preaching a wrong gospel that will not save in the dispensation of grace, and yet they confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. So based on this verse, I know they're of God, right? You end up making the wrong judgment about that. Now over here, there's going to be a situation in which the confession upon which the true believers are identified, the, the rock upon which they're built, is the reality that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ, you see. And that stands in stark contrast to another that's going to be out here claiming to be and actually is an antichrist. Two camps, right? And the issue out here when that division policy and that exposure policy is in place, there's going to be some things that are brought to bear to manifest which rock is Israel going to build their national house on. Are they going to build their house upon the rock of Christ, the rock of Israel? Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God, as Simon Peter confessed in Matthew 16. Is that what their confession is and what they're built upon? Or are they going after another that's come in his own name, claiming to be the Christ of God? See, those that are not of God are not going to be confessing that Jesus Christ, or that Jesus is the Christ. Specific situation that exists out here where the test brings the reality to the surface can't use that in the dispensation of grace. It's not designed to work in the dispensation of grace. Now, when I was coming up in churches and churches that did not rightly divide these, these epistles, these Hebrew epistles, the way that verses like this were explained or, or tried to compensate it for without right division and recognizing where the doctrine belongs is really through trying to change what the verse is saying. Right? Because those, those churches that I, I came from recognize that there are some pseudo-Christianity out there that teach a wrong gospel and they're, they're false teachers based on doctrine that the Apostle Paul teaches. They recognize that. And so, you know, you can't just take it for what it says on the surface and apply the test because we know they could pass that test if we use this. And so we're going to kind of try to change what the verse is talking about and make it more about the issue of the deity of Christ. And make it as though it's an issue of he that confesseth that, uh, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. That's kind of the concept. And certainly we believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is deity. No doubt about that. It's a true doctrine. But the verse doesn't say whoso confesseth that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. It says that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. It's not so much an issue about his deity as it is about his messiahship. Right? Who he is to Israel. 
I'm trying to make it an issue of deity and kind of get around it that way, but the, the verse is declaring something about who Jesus Christ is and their confession concerning him and, and uh, the ability to identify the Spirit of God working in these children as a result of, of their recognition of Jesus Christ. And so right division and, and understanding these things is very important. Not just, you know, as, as something that we stand up here and talk about, but a matter of, of practical discernment in day-to-day -day life living in the dispensation of grace. Knowing where the doctrine is, how do we identify these things, when the doctrine applies and why it applies where it does. It's a critical thing. And so we must recognize as we're looking at John's epistles and as we study these things more in detail in the weeks to come that he's giving them tests that's meant to apply for a very specific time. To identify a very specific thing in connection with a very specific program. And it's not the mystery of the dispensation of grace. It's the last time of prophecy. And we'll see that as we get into it but wanted to deal with some general things tonight talk a little bit about the, the connection uh, between the gospel of john and and how he's manifesting that exposure policy and, and making these distinctions and we'll pick up on some things in john next time and, and make some further links on specifics and uh, try to get into the meat of the epistle that time but just want to kind of set the groundwork so that as you're reading through it you can at least see some of these concepts coming to the surface and it is very repetitive and I think that if you'll read it on your own, you'll, you'll see those things this week start coming to the surface. And it'll help you all the more next week when we get into the meat of the verses. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for the time tonight. We thank you for the truth of the word. We pray that it would uh, serve as the foundation for the things we're going to look at in the weeks to come. We give you the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.